Hello everyone, this is Glyn True, and ever since becoming a Christian about two years ago now, I have begun studying other religions as well, mainly Islam, to see if my own worldview holds up to scrutiny. I have read parts of the Quran, and I have watched numerous debates between people like Shabir Ali and James White, um, which are the most famous apologists on both sides. So I've heard pretty much all the arguments for Islam, yet remain unconvinced. Although I am by no means an expert in Islam, I feel I know enough to make a video about it. So first of all, I'd like to talk about the similarities between Christianity and Islam, because we do share some similarities. Both religions are based on Abraham, just like Ju Judaism as well. Both religions believe in one God, and both religions believe that God has spoken to us, spoken to his creation, and revealed himself to us. The way God has revealed himself to us differs in Christianity and Islam. I'd also like to talk about the things I like about Islam. For example, I don't mind the wearing of headscarves by women. In fact, the Christian women of Corinth wore headscarves, and there are still some Orthodox Christian communities who still do today. So I have no problem at all with more modesty in apparel. I think that's quite important in today's culture, to be honest. I also respect the dietary laws in Islam. I myself eat kosher because I believe God prefers us to be doing so. And I also have general respect for the five pillars of Islam. Having said all that, I would like to give you five reasons why I concluded Islam is not of God. Keep in mind, this will not be an attack on Muslims. I personally know some Muslims whom I would consider friends. Rather, this will be a critique of Islam, the ideology. If you are a Muslim watching this video, perhaps you could respond to my points in the comment section below. So with that, I give you five reasons why Islam is not of God. Number one, the continuation error of the Quran. The Quran claims to be the final revelation in a series of revelations of God, the order of which was first the Torah, then the Gospel, then the Quran. Fair enough. So then why don't Jews and Christians consider the Quran as the final revelation? Let's find out, shall we? You see, Christians added the New Testament to the Old, completing one book, the Bible. So why haven't Muslims done the same? Why haven't they simply taken the Quran and added it to the Bible, having all three revelations in it? Um, the answer, of course, is very simple. The reason is because the Quran vastly contradicts the Bible and therefore cannot be included in the same book. It's funny really, the Quran agrees with Christians on many things, things which nobody else agrees with us upon, like the virgin birth of Jesus, the fact that he was the Messiah, and the fact that he performed miracles. Of course, in the Quran's interpretation of the Messiah, Jesus failed miserably. He was supposed to bring the Jews back to God, yet he somehow started a new religion. In contrast to the narrative of the Bible, Jesus didn't fail at all. Of course, it was his God-given mission to die on the cross, thus atoning for our sins and reconciling mankind back unto God. And he commanded his followers to preach God's grace through the nations, resulting in millions of people worshiping the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, interestingly, the Quran agrees with the Bible on some things, but disagrees with the Bible on the most important things about Christ, like the crucifixion, the deity of Christ, and the resurrection, which are coincidentally the three most important beliefs about Christ from a Christian's perspective. On one hand, the Quran teaches the inspiration of the scriptures, which came before it, but on the other, it vastly contradicts them leading Christians and Jews to reject the Quran and leading Muslims to conclude that the Bible has been corrupted without any actual evidence to back it up. Yes, there are textual variances in the Bible. Every work of antiquity has them. We have over 5,900 Greek New Testament manuscripts and over 24,000 in other languages. So with that amount of manuscripts, more than any other work of antiquity, there are bound to be a lot of textual variances which are not corruptions. For example, you can't find a single full manuscript of one of the Gospels which doesn't include the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even the Quran has textual variances. I mean, that's just common sense. So let's look at what some of these contradictions are. I already mentioned some of them, but let's look into them in more detail. 
Number two, the denial of the crucifixion. The Quran coming 600 years after Jesus makes the bold claim that Jesus was in fact never crucified nor killed on the cross. In Surah 4, verses 156 to 157, the Quran says, that they said and boast, we killed Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety, they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power wise. I think this goes without saying, but this statement of the Quran goes against all the historical evidence we have of the life of Jesus. Even skeptics, atheists and agnostics like John Dominic Crossan and Bart Ehrman concur on the fact that Jesus was crucified. In interpreting the previously mentioned passage, Muslims have come up with different theories throughout history. I'm going to present two of them and point out some flaws in them. The most common theory is called the replacement theory. It claims that Jesus was not crucified, but he was replaced by someone else on the cross. And Allah made it appear to the bystanders as though it was Jesus on the cross, even though it wasn't. And the most common opinion is that it was Judas on the cross, not Jesus, the one who had betrayed him. Apart from there being no evidence to substantiate this theory, there is a problem if you think about it logically. It effectively makes God a deceiver who deceived everyone into thinking that it was Jesus crucified, even though it wasn't, and leading his followers to start the largest false religion in history. God so deceived the world, according to this theory, that he started the largest false religion in history. If that's the kind of God you want to serve, then by all means go ahead, but I don't. The second theory, which is less popular, but starting to get some traction, thanks to apologists like Shabir Ali, is called the Swoon Theory. And it is largely believed by the Ahmadi sect of the Muslim people. Nabil Qureshi, the author of the book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, was one of them. You might have heard of him. And the Swoon Theory claims that Jesus was crucified, but survived crucifixion and was put into the tomb alive. And later, God called Jesus up from the tomb while he was still alive and showed his disciples who were weeping and sorrowful a vision from heaven, which they so terribly misunderstood and thought that Jesus had risen from the dead. Thus, if one believes this theory, Allah once again started the largest false religion in history. And he was powerless to stop missionaries like Paul from spreading this false religion doesn't add up to me. Of course, these two theories also contradict the narratives of the Bible. The replacement theory holds no water because Judas had already hung himself by the time of the crucifixion of Jesus. And the swoon theory puts into question the expertise of the Roman soldier who verified that Jesus had died by spearing him into the side. I would think that Roman soldiers would have known what they were doing. So in denying a sure historical fact, like the crucifixion of Jesus, the Quran loses further authenticity in my eyes. Number three, the misunderstanding of the Trinity. The author of the Quran makes no attempt in trying to understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Multiple times, the Quran says, do not say three, desist, say one. Allah is only one God. This is an obvious reference to the Trinity. Well, right off the bat, that's a misunderstanding of the Trinity. Christians do not believe in three gods, but one God. And another problem is that the Quran falsely identifies the Trinity. Um, I know of no other verse in the Quran which identifies the three, but this one, if you do, let me know. We read in Surah 5, 116, And behold, Allah will say, O Jesus, the son of Mary, Didst thou say unto men, Worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of Allah? He will say, Glory to thee! Never could I say what I had no right to say. Had I said such a thing, thou wouldest indeed have known it. Thou knowest what is in my heart, though I know not what is in thine. For thou knowest in full all that is hidden. In this verse, the Trinity is defined as God, Mary, and Jesus. And that has never been, nor will ever be, the Trinity. 
The Trinity had long been defined by the time of Muhammad as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. As early as the second century, according to writings of the Church Fathers, such as Ignatius. I can understand a 6th century Middle Eastern man making this mistake, but not Allah, the omniscient, who's supposed to be the author of the Quran. Number four, leaving Islam deserves the death penalty. According to the Quran and the Hadith collection, leaving Islam is not to be tolerated and any deserters are to be executed a practice that has been carried out for nearly 14 centuries. There is some ambiguity to the reference in the Quran itself, but no such ambiguity in the Hadith collection. There are many passages in both Bukhari and Muslim which mention apostasy and the punishment thereof. In Bukhari, volume 9, number 58, we read, Narrated Abu Burda, Abu Musa said, Behold, there was a fettered man beside Abu Musa. Muad asked, Who is this man? Abu Musa said he was a Jew and became a Muslim and then reverted back to Judaism. Then Abu Musa requested Mu'ad to sit down, but Mu'ad said, I will not sit down till he has been killed. This is the judgment of Allah and his messenger and repeated it thrice. Then Abu Musa ordered that the man be killed and he was killed. Abu Musa added, then we discussed the night prayers. Furthermore, in Muslim book 16, number 4125, we read, Abdullah reported Allah's messenger as saying, it is not permissible to take the life of a Muslim who bears testimony to the fact that there is no God but Allah and I am the messenger of Allah. But in one of the three cases, the married adulterer, a life for life, and the deserter of his din, Islam, abandoning the community. We also know from historical records of the early years of Islam that many apostates were killed by the caliphs following the death of Muhammad. I think all people living in the West will have a problem with this doctrine. Um, it is simply barbaric and fear-inducing. Muslims are kept in the fold because if they should leave, there's a risk of them getting killed. I realize Muslims in the West have less of a concern of this happening when leaving their religion, but in some Islamic countries, apostasy is still a punishable offense, even by death. Number five, the lack of love in Islam. In Islam, God's love is restricted to those who love him first, to believers. We read in Surah 30, verse 43 to 45, that he may reward those who believe and do good out of his grace. Surely he does not love the unbelievers. And the Quran also calls Christians and Jews the worst of creatures. In Surah 98, verse 6, Christians are called the worst of creatures. If we compare that to Christianity, where Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is a profound statement in my opinion. If God is perfect, does it not follow that he has to be perfectly loving as well? And does perfect love not have to love those who hate you and revile you, as well as those who love you and praise you? I'll give you an example. Say you were a rich ruler and you had expensive clothes and you had a son who fell in the lake or in the mud and was drowning. Would you care at all about your fancy clothes before jumping in and saving your son? No, of course not. If this is how much a parent loves their child, how much more does God love us, his children? Yet in the Quran, God restricts his love to those who love him first, which is a love condemned by Jesus. Now, 
There are many more reasons why I reject Islam, but I wanted to focus on these five in this video. In conclusion, the denial of basic historical facts, like the crucifixion of Jesus, as well as the core beliefs of Christianity, lead me to reject that Islam is a false religion. In fact, Jesus warned us of false prophets who would come to deceive many. And I believe Muhammad was one of these false prophets who may have received genuine revelation, only it was not from God, but of some more sinister origin. Finally, I want to talk about the gospel or the Injil, as Muslims call it. What is the gospel? It means good news. The good news of what? The good news of Jesus Christ, offering forgiveness of sins and reconciliation back unto God to anyone who will believe in him and his sacrifice on the cross. You see, us Christians can have assurance of salvation, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. He paid for our sins on the cross. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ Jesus took our punishment upon himself so that we wouldn't have to. That is how loving God is. To any Muslims watching this video, perhaps you could pick up a New Testament and read the life of Jesus from the Bible's perspective, just like I've done with the Quran. Thank you for watching. God bless.